This week in the broadcast premiere of The Record, where should the Mound City put a tent city? With poverty and homelessness on the rise, City Hall is on the hunt for solutions. Alderwoman Alicia Sanye is on the record. A wealthy Democrat thinks he can become Missouri's next governor. But who's Mike Hamra? The political newcomer makes his broadcast debut on the record. And they found a speaker in D.C. But another speaker comes under fire in Jefferson City. Political analyst Dr. Anita Mannion breaks down the GOP infighting on the Hill and here at home. It's all coming up right now. Welcome to the broadcast premiere of The Record. I'm Mark Maxwell. In our first episode launching this program, each week we'll bring you the biggest stories impacting Missouri, Illinois, and St. Louis politics. Featuring hard-hitting interviews that are fair, balanced, and focused on facts first and foremost. More on that mission later this half hour. But let's get right to it. Extreme poverty is on the rise, and in this region, signs of those symptoms are showing up, especially in downtown St. Louis. Tent cities have formed along the riverfront, under bridges throughout the city, and most recently, under Mayor Tashara Jones' window at City Hall. The city has opened some new shelter beds in recent months, but the surge in demand is far outpacing supply. As that problem grows more urgent, a newly installed progressive board of aldermen has waded into the complex issue and so far can't quite seem to agree on the best way forward. Seventh Ward Alderwoman Alicia Sanye drafted the unhoused Bill of Rights, and she joins us now on the record. Good to have you with us. Thank you for having me. You said you made a strong comment the other day at a committee hearing that St. Louis is perpetuating poverty. What is a policy that you can point to right now and say that perpetuates and creates a cycle of poverty? The strongest point that I would say that perpetuates poverty is right now the knowing that zero shelters have opened through the process that we have in place in the last 15 years is a perpetuation of poverty. Um, we have to make sure that when we have processes in place that we are there are regulation processes but not elimination processes. And obviously in that hearing that you were there to see I made the point that if we had a process that hadn't allowed a liquor license to be granted in 15 years we would have changed it. If we had a policy that allowed that hadn't allowed for a development subsidies such as tips or abatements to be granted in 15 years, we would have changed it month six. Here is a process that is not allowing those who are most vulnerable amongst us to get access to what they need to get stabilized. It's been in place for 15 years. It's been effective and we have a responsibility to change it. One of the clear differences is a city can collect tax from a liquor store and would have a hard time collecting much tax from a tent camp. Correct. You would have a hard time collecting tax from a tent camp, but sometimes as a city, especially when you're talking about financial responsibility, you look at what are you already spending on the issue and could you actually save money if you were to address it proactively. So right now when we deal with our unhoused population, we have to use a lot of police officer uh, staffing. You heard the firefighters who came to the meeting and talked about how it's something that's also fa falling on them. We have unhoused people who obviously yeah, cycle yeah, through you. emergency rooms and jails, and so those things do cost public tax dollars. So why the argument could be looked at that it doesn't save it it costs you money you are spending money on it and then of course I will highlight that they have to remember that many in our unhoused population are the working poor so they do get up every day and they do go to work and they do pay taxes but they are still poor and unable to afford housing have you recognized that popular opinion may not be in your corner on this or how do you how do you feel the public thought has, has shifted in the last few months seeing all of what we've seen unfold. So first, I want to just acknowledge that as a board, I think we've made a step in the right direction by, for the first time, being able to have this conversation. This bill, a uh, homeless bill of rights, was proposed in 2017 by Alderwoman Green at the time, then 2019 by Alderwoman Gracia. But we didn't even get to the point of having a hearing because we didn't have city leadership that decided it was worth the conversation. And that was all pre-COVID, pre-exacerbated poverty. Absolutely, absolutely. And what I'll say to public opinion, what I hear from my constituents and what I hear from my community is, I want to be able to be in community with folks who are unhoused, but I can't do that if there's no space for them to go. If the only space for the unhoused to go is to go in the park, if the only place for them to go is to go in vacant buildings, if the only place for them to go is to go under the banister of my businesses when I open up, it's very hard for us to have in community. So what I hear in public opinion is I want city leaders to take this issue seriously and to bring a solution that involves them addressing it so that we can have community amongst us and we can give resources to those who, again, are very vulnerable. And especially when you think about the fact that it's one in five children who are unhoused when you mm -hmm. think about the fact that 25 to 50 percent of women that are unhoused are fleeing domestic violence relationships, most people want to see folks get help and get resources. It sounds like you're saying the best permanent step is just more shelter capacity, more bed space. But until we get there, until we can build that, what do we do next? I want to ask you about one of the uh, things in your bill. You've said in committee hearings at several junctures 
that people in poverty, homeless people, uh, are not necessarily dangerous to others, that in fact they're more likely to become victims of a violent crime. Mm -hmm. Why then does your bill uh, recommend that a police officer be stationed at each one of these tent sites or some sort of police surveillance? Yes, so um, you know, as a legislator you have to deal with the folks who are in place and you know when you're thinking of your community and you're thinking of the public, they were all concerned about safety. And the safety does not have to ultimately look like police officers. At the end of the day, if we were to have an intentional encampment, there would be a security plan and a security proposal and there's very different measures that could be happening even when I had conversations with the police chief that's kind of what we discussed but it was better for budgeting processes if you use the budget of the cost of officers you know that what you have allocated to cover security should be covered in you know the request for a proposal that will ultimately be be issued. Uh, we should note for our audience people that have been following along that uh, you were one of at least two members of the Board of Aldermen who were out there physically helping people take down their campsites when they were being pushed from the city lawn so you're not just somebody speaking about this issue you've been out there uh, helping these people through this. Winter is coming, as many advocates have said. The temperatures are taking a turn for the worse very soon. How urgent is this situation, and what's your degree of optimism that you can get agreement at this divided board over this issue in time to save people from the death that we saw last year? I think it's extremely urgent, and I take very seriously my responsibility as a legislator, as a political leader, and as someone with some class privilege. We're talking about children, and we're talking about families, and we're talking about people who are very vulnerable amongst us. And right now in our city, it takes over 400 days to get connected to shelter and other resources. So I'm going to advocate for something that could serve them in the meantime. Um, as far as you know, my optimism for getting my colleagues on board, I've seen us navigate and have conversations about tough issue. The gun issue that we had with Alderman Spencer's bill was not an easy conversation. We made our way through that. The conversation around the short-term regulation bills, we made our way through that, which I'll add, we decided that conditional use was adequate for Airbnb properties, even though we've had violent issues and murders. We all decided as a board that was okay there. So and for our viewers following along, that basically says in the current petition process. We have to get 51% of neighbors to approve. If we do away with that and have a different approval process, the city can tell you, okay, you want to open a homeless shelter here, fine, but you must do this, that, and the other to satisfy at least some basic standards. One of the things I've seen in public discourse is that if you take away plat and petition, you're limiting democracy. But plat and petition itself is inherently kind of undemocratic because only property homeowners and registered voters count as a part of that 51%. But we know that over 50% of our city are tenants, and we know that less than 30 percent of people go and vote in our elections so by going so the to richest among us are deciding the, fa the fate richest, of the least of these exactly so a complex issue no easy answer but we thank you for uh joining us for part of this conversation we'll continue to follow along thanks for joining us thank you a new democrat jumps into the race for missouri governor we hear from mike hamra next for adventure for climbing for splashing, for towing, for premium, for capable. The GMC AT4 lineup, premium and capable. That's professional grade from GMC. Step up to GMC with 1.9% APR on 2023 GMC Acadia models. Plus, no monthly payments until 2024. Mix and match your favorites for $4.69 at McDonald's. Choose between the delicious sausage McMuffin with egg with its savory hot sausage or the scrumptious bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit brushed with real butter. Bite into breakfast bliss. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. Welcome back to Sam's Hot Takes. What's hot now? Spectrum One Stream. It's internet, unlimited mobile, advanced Wi-Fi, and this Zumo Stream Box free with Spectrum TV. It makes searching for shows and movies across live TV and streaming apps easy. It's streaming simplified. Get internet for $49.99 a month, plus advanced Wi-Fi and your first line of unlimited mobile free for 12 months. Plus add Spectrum TV and get a free Zumo Stream Box for 12 months. Call 833-788-4999. Visit Spectrum.com or stop by a Spectrum store today. Discover the perfect paint for your home has never been easier at Menards. Fast Prime 2 interior primer and sealer is available, formulated with stain blocking technology, and has an exceptional dry time. Get a gallon for $17.79 after 11% rebate. Plan smart with Zinzer Smart Coat and interactive tools at smartcoat.com. Buy smart in store or online for home delivery. And paint smart with this advanced interior paint and primer in one. It's just $19.56 after 11% off. Save big money at when your dining set is an on-trend mid-century beauty that comes in three stylish colors with Bavapedic chairs and only costs $5.99 for the six-piece set, there's only one thing to say. Oh, my Bob! 
Bob's Discount Furniture. To build the Honda CRV Hybrid, we took everything you love about the CRV and kicked it up a notch with greater power. For a CRV unlike any before, adventure confidently with the most fuel efficient full line automaker over the last five years. The CRV and CRV Hybrid, part of the Honda line of rugged vehicles. Visit your local Honda dealer where new vehicles are arriving daily. Buy online or reserve from select Honda dealers. Missouri House Minority Leader Crystal Quaid will have some competition in her bid to become the Democratic nominee in the race for governor. And he comes from her hometown. Fast food franchise owner Mike Hammer has deep pockets and says he'll work to expand the middle class from the governor's mansion. Mike Hammer is now on the record. Good to have you with us. First question, you've got a pretty successful business going. Are you sure you want to jump into politics? I am. Uh, you know, for the last 22 years, um, I've grown our family owned business really from uh, 26 locations to almost 200 locations. We employ over 7,400 people in 11 states, but almost 2,000 of those people are here in the state of Missouri. And we've been very successful because we've we've leaned into supporting people in those 22 years and made, making a difference for them. We've also contributed heavily back to the communities we do business. And for us, it's about uh, my passion and love for supporting people. And I see bringing that same passion and love to the state of Missouri and making a difference for people here in the state. I wonder if perhaps you see the Democratic Party as an underdog path to get to that governor's mansion. We'll talk about that some. Some of our viewers are seeing snippets of your campaign video as you just launched on Thursday this week in your campaign. A lot of people are going to connect the dots quickly. Fast food guy wants to be a politician. What do you think about Missouri's minimum wage? You know, right now uh, we're at $12. Uh, we actually pay over that uh, because of the competitive market. But there's a proposal out there to make it $15 in 2026. And my guess is that, you know, we'll be at that level already from a market standpoint by 2026 as that phases in up to $15. Would you support but, you that? Know, people deserve good wages in the state of Missouri and they should get that so they can support their families. So I want to make sure I'm clear. You would support a $15 minimum wage in Missouri statewide? I would. I would. We do business in other states, 11 other states, uh, where minimum wage increases have already occurred. When minimum wage goes up incrementally, you know, on an annual basis, it helps put more money in people's pockets. They spend more money and that helps stimulate the economy. So how do you answer the question about being a political outsider new to this lane? Sure, you've got experience in the corporate world and corporate America and franchising and growing uh, restaurant businesses across the country. Very different job description. How do you explain to voters the one set of qualities can adapt to the other kind of job description? Like I said, I've grown a business, you know, uh, for the last 22 years. It's a, while we're in the food business, it's a highly complex business. And I wear a lot of different hats. Even today, as a CEO, I take on varying different, you know, roles in the organization. I believe a lot of the qualities and attributes uh, that have made me a good CEO and supporting people, I can carry those over to the state. A lot of what I've been able to do in business, I can translate that over to running the state of Missouri. It can be a challenge, if I'm being frank, to cover a political newcomer because we just don't know anything about, for example, a voting record or who you are, who you've been. Uh, but that can also be interesting. We get to know you as voters get to know you over the course of this campaign. We hope to do that. Democratic primary voters are going to want to know you're one of them. And one of the very few things we could learn about you from reading the early reports was that voting records show you've only voted once in Missouri over the last 30 years we could find. So when Missouri Democrats were going to the ballot to defeat right to work, to raise the minimum wage, to expand Medicaid, where were you? Well, I've actually been involved in politics my whole life here in the state of Missouri, going all the way back to Joe Teasdale when I helped, you know, as a kid, you know, volunteer to support him and his campaign. And Ralph Slavens, who was running for the state Senate back in those days, myself and my family have supported people running for office for 50 years here in the state of Missouri. I've actually even participated at the 1984 Democratic Convention. My dad was a delegate from Missouri. I've been very active in Missouri politics for many, many years. Were you just voting elsewhere then? I was building companies in other states, you know, part of our business. We're based here in Springfield, Missouri. But there was a time when I was uh, a resident of the Chicago and voted in, that, in the Chicago primaries and and general elections uh, there. Very interesting. Well, thank you for joining us. We do hope to learn much more about your policy positions, how you'll approach this primary in the matchup with Crystal Quaid, uh, a hometown Democrat, if you will. House Republicans finally found a speaker to step up on Capitol Hill. Why some Missouri Republicans want their speaker to step down. Dr. Anita Mannion joins us in studio after the break.
I was having a lot of sinus infections. My sinuses were clogged, pressure, headaches. Linda suffered for years with chronic sinus infections. Now, her issues are gone. How? A minimally invasive procedure done in the office of St. Louis Sinus Center called balloon sinuplasty. I would do it again in a heartbeat, and I would definitely recommend it for someone else. Do you suffer with chronic sinus infections? Set an appointment today with St. Louis Sinus Center. How easy is life in the new Buick Encore GX? Piece of cake. I was going to say easy as pie, but that's way better. Backing up with your Buick, it's a walk in the park. Or, you know, a kayak in the park. <laughs> Staying connected is a breeze with Wi-Fi and unlimited data. What's the password? You'll be hearing that a lot. Life's easier in the new 2024 Buick Encore GX. NetCredit is here to say yes you believed in me. to a personal loan or line of credit, even when other lenders won't. Apply online in minutes and get funds deposited the next business day or sooner. Go to netcredit.com. NetCredit. Credit to the people. We've got questions about Medicare plans. Well, we've got a lot of answers. How can I help? Well, for starters, do you have a Medicare plan I can actually afford? How about a plan with a $0 monthly premium? Well, that's a great start. What other benefits can we get? Things like dental, vision, and hearing. But let me help you pick the plan that's right for you. <laughs> Don't wait. Call 1-800-ETNA-FOR-YOU to get answers to your questions and pick a plan that's right for you. And let's make healthier happen together. Renewal by Anderson can make replacing your windows and doors really affordable. And getting a price? <laughs> well, that's easy. Just scan this code and self-schedule your own appointment. You don't have to talk to anyone, and you can do it 24 hours a day. Just scan and pick a date and time that work for you. Renewal by Anderson has more five-star reviews than other leading full-service window replacement companies. Learn why. Scan the code now to self-schedule your window and door appointment. Three weeks of congressional chaos came to a close Wednesday as House Republicans rallied behind a new speaker. Mike Johnson claimed the gavel, rising from the backbench of the GOP leadership team, his ascent to power tracing the steps of three high-profile Republicans who stumbled on their way up that hill. Political science professor and Dr. Anita Mannion is here with analysis for the record. Anita, a lot of Americans asking this week, Mike Johnson, who's that? Yeah, I bet that was a trending Google search. I know that even senators who were asked, do you support this, said, let me Google that guy first. Um, he is definitely new. Uh, in 140 years, he has the least experience in the House of any speaker we've had. But some people think that's a good thing. Yeah, uh, Matt Gates is one of them. Uh, he's somebody who certainly seemed happy, but Democrats also seemed happy. I have a compilation of some of their remarks. Corey Bush calling Johnson, quote, dangerous and the GOP dysfunctional for choosing him. Nikki Budzinski, a Democrat from Metro East, urged Johnson to recognize the realities of a divided government uh, and not be so uh, dug in. Illinois Democratic Party Chair Lisa Hernandez might have had the most interesting remarks, though. Uh, she said this, quote, that Johnson's election cements the Republican Party's descent into MAGA extremism, calling him a, quote, election denying, insurrection defending Trump sycophant. What do you make of Democrats' efforts to paint him and the party after this? Well, I definitely think the Democrats will try to capitalize on the fact, particularly in swing districts, that he has been um, very anti-abortion, that he has been aligned with former President Trump on a lot of issues, including some of the efforts to overturn the election. Matt Gates even said in support of Mike Johnson that this shows that the MAGA wing of Congress is ascendant. And so I think he does have firm MAGA credentials, and that might make you really happy or that might make you really mad. You wonder how Kevin McCarthy feels, and you wonder how Kevin McCarthy's backers in the House feels. We saw Jason Smith, a congressman from Missouri, calling Mike Johnson a, quote, proven conservative who's honorable and smart. Ann Wagner from the 2nd District called him, quote, an honorable man of faith. And Mike Boss called him a consistent conservative with this, a steady hand. Those comments seemed kind of just safe. I, I don't know how you... Uh, Republicans are just sort of stepping in line, glad to have this chapter behind them. I think like. they're so happy to have this done, to move on and to be able to function. I think he was a palatable candidate that got 
a unanimous vote from the Republicans, partially because they were ready to be done with this mess, but also because he kind of combines those conservative Christian credentials of a Mike Pence with that populism and sort of um, anti-establishment Donald Trump brand. And so maybe he can blend both sides of the Republican Party. Yeah, it's interesting. Your analysis on why you think a lesser known candidate might have won where other high profile names faltered. Yeah, so he has actually said, Mike Johnson's actually said he's the Robin to Jim Jordan's Batman. Ideologically and on policy issues, they're very much aligned, but he's sort of the kinder, gentler version. He's not out there as a firebrand and being on TV and railing. He sort of puts a nice face on the more conservative values. Jim Jordan made a career for many years attacking his own party and his chickens uh, came home to roost, if you will. Missouri has had a mini mutant in the House GOP too, closer to home in Jefferson City. Speaker Dean Plocker has faced calls to resign. He's brushing them off. Basically, he's calling this an administrative error or a checkbook accounting error. But uh, Missouri law allows a politician to file a reimbursement to the state if they travel on official business. Or you can reimburse, you can pay for expenses like that out of your campaign fund. The donors give you money to run for office. You can use that money to pay for your way around the state. You can't right. do both. That's right. And in his case, he was caught uh, paying for campaign expenses and then asking the state to pay him back. So at least $4,000 that wasn't really ever his landed in his pocket. A pattern of practice that began in 2018. Now he's starting to pay it back after he got caught. Republicans are calling for him to step down. He's painting it as a leftist smear. Is that something that independent voters are going to by when it comes time for him to ask for their vote? I think it will be challenging. You know, you see members of his own party sort of calling him out on this, which tells you he might face some challenges in his upcoming bid for a lieutenant governor. So I can see that, you know, the campaign ads compete themselves. Not only has this been a pattern over multiple years and multiple incidents, but also the fact that you know he only started to pay it back once this um, sort of exposure happens I think is a little bit incriminating. And to be fair, the biggest bulk of this expense did happen in recent events in this sure. last summer. Uh, the earlier expenses in 2018 and 19 were a paltry sum here and there. They weren't very big, but still it, it does paint that picture like maybe this is something that's been going on for a while. How much more is there if we start looking into it? Yeah, when you get down to the nitty gritty, that's not necessarily what we see in campaign ads that voters see, right? So what you could expect to see in this campaign season are accusations of him spending taxpayers dollars, you know, stealing and being dishonest, whether that's true or not. Mm -hmm. And some of these quotes that people in his own party have criticized him. Like Bob Onder, who's running for lieutenant governor, or, <laughs> that's or who right. may be running for lieutenant governor. Uh, by the way, we should say that uh, we did invite Speaker Plocker on for an interview. He couldn't make it this week. Uh, and he says he's not going to resign. Uh, resign rather. Anita, thanks. Absolutely. Good to be here. Stick with us. When we come back, we check the record and look back at how this show was born. That's next. Once you pick up an Arby's cheesesteak, it's going to be tough to set that thing back down. Hey, put it back. The commercial is not over. Arby's, we have the meat. At Creators, we handcraft every batch of our delicious popcorn. Like our Creators cheese and caramel mix. Great on their own, even better together. Try Creators, handcrafted small batch popcorn. That's a pretty tight spot. Watch this. Your Buick parks itself. That's so you. Of course you know where we're going. That's so you. I got a six cents. And a head-up display. They're here. At the heart of every Buick SUV is you. Get 1.9% APR, plus current eligible non-GM owners get up to $12.50 purchase allowance on 2023 Buick SUV models. Plus, no monthly payments until 2024. Greatness doesn't happen overnight. It takes time, focus, and dedication. At Shelter Insurance, we understand that because we put in the hard work and dedication for decades. And that commitment has paid off with award-winning customer service for your auto, home, and life insurance. See Shelter Agent Jason Hogan, John Micah, or Luke Bryson in St. Charles today. Watch me. Watch me jump, dive, and splash. Put me by a pool, I'll be soaked in a flash. A girl in the water to swim like a fish. Just two simple legs, that was my wish. I'm a sea turtle, shark, a seal on a slide. This is my day of fun, with nothing to hide. Watch me. Pioneers in orthotic and prosthetic technology at Shriners Children's. 
the most amazing care anywhere. The Bush family is a racing family. I mean, we've come from that. My dad was a car guy, his dad was a car guy. We enjoyed the aspect of being able to have family time in the garage, but then also going to the racetrack trying to bring home wins. Our dad raised us up to become champions. My brother's a champion, I'm a champion. So all credit due to him. Being with RCR, I've really come to understand the family relationship, the tie-in between M&M as well as RCR. It's a family type relationship. Before we go, let's check the record. Those of our viewers who have been watching the streaming version of this program for the last year may recognize the end of our show where we hold current events under the lens of history. Or sometimes where we have to fact check or add truth or context to something a politician said or didn't say. Over the last year, we've hosted U.S. Senators, members of Congress, governors, candidates running for statewide office, U.S. Ambassadors, members of the President's Cabinet, federal judges, mayors, county executives, and members of the Board of Aldermen. And the list goes on. This week, we heard from two Democrats. Last week, from two Republicans. Sometimes from Illinois, sometimes from Missouri. But always with the pressing issues facing our elected officials and always with an open mind and a curious approach. Our world has changed an awful lot since I first started covering politics about a decade ago. Back then, I was convinced apathy was the sedative lulling voters to sleep. Now, it often seems anger is the sledgehammer driving us apart. In both cases, curiosity is the cure. After all, as the Missouri Honor Awards Bulletin for Distinguished Work in Journalism said 90 years ago last month, it's our job in the press to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. For nearly a century, that noble ideal has boosted the lofty ambitions of newsmen and women who see this job as a public service. But that quote, its true origin, actually came from a humorist years prior who liked to poke fun at the press. It was back in 1902 when Finley Peter Dunn wrote under a pen name as Mr. Dooley in the Chicago Evening Post. And, well, his quote was actually to lampoon newspapers who were often too full of themselves, the center of the universe, and thought they ran the town. We'll try to keep that perspective in mind here, too. After all, it's much easier to come up with questions than it is to come up with answers. That's all for us today. We'll see you right back here after Sports Plus next Sunday. Until then, we're off the record. If you're looking for more context, accountability, or scrutiny of your politicians, The Record will broadcast every Sunday. Each week, we'll put political leaders on the record for hard-hitting interviews that are fair, balanced, and focused on facts. Tune in every Sunday night after Sports Plus. The show will continue to stream on KSDK.com, 5 Plus, and our YouTube channel.